All right, y'all ready? John chapter 20, starting in verse number 24. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, somebody say eight days. After eight days, his disciples were again inside this room and Thomas then was with them. Jesus came. Let me put an emphasis. He came again, the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here, Thomas. Look at my hands. Reach your hand here. Put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, Thomas. Don't doubt, but be believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who have not seen yet have believed. Somebody say amen. 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 You may take your seats. I want to entitle this uh, sermon today, Thomas, the twin of the modern world. Thomas, twin of the modern world. Jesus on his journey these three years, he did ministry in Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee and other places in that region. When he began his ministry, he began gathering disciples. Somebody say disciples. He began gathering disciples. Honestly, the number of the disciples is really not given for there were many disciples. But we know the first grouping of disciples that we call the twelve. They were 12 disciples and later on in his ministry as they had learned and as they had grew and matured and as Jesus uh, invested more in them, they became known more than just the 12 disciples. They became known as the 12 apostles. Leading up to Jesus' crucifixion and of course, consequently, the resurrection, they went from 12 to 11. You do remember Judas, don't you? And what he had done. And, and, and speaking of Judas, when you think of the disciples, when you think of the disciples, those 12, those 11, um, you, you think of them in terms of maybe their nickname or a name that they gained because of their character or their demeanor, something they did. Or you think of them in terms of how they acted. Uh, and, and, and we know them by that. You, you understand them by that. There are, there are 12. I won't, I won't list all, all 12. But, but we knew John, John, one of the uh, disciples, John, also one of the authors of, of the God, one of the gospels that, bear, that bears his name, John. I, I remember John is the one that Jesus loved. None of the other gospel writers say that, but John put that in his own book. John wrote, he was the one that Jesus loved. And I think it was not that Jesus did not love the other disciples. He loved all of them. How many even know he loved all of them? Sometimes when we think of the disciples, many of us think of them in their 20s or 30s. These disciples were really young. They were teenagers. And I believe maybe Peter being the eldest of this group and John being the youngest of this group. When you think of a, a bunch of teenagers uh, traveling down a dusty road, I, I sometimes I think we look at folk in the Bible differently than we look at ourselves. How many even know they were human just like us? And I can imagine, uh, uh, listen, you, you lead a bunch of teenagers somewhere, amen without iPads and iPhones. Talk to me, somebody. Uh, I guess they were playing kick the rock down the path. And I can imagine with John possibly being the youngest one that they picked on John. They pushed John. If somebody was behind John when John was walking. They tripped John. You know, they weren't mad at John. That's just how, how kids play. Amen. And I can imagine because John was the youngest and probably the weakest among them that Jesus took special care of John. I can imagine my sanctified expositional intuition that there were times when, when they would walk and Jesus would look uh, specifically for John to bring John under his wing. Y'all leave John alone now. And so from that, John felt a special connection with Jesus. So he called himself the disciple that Jesus loved. I know John by that. I know John by that. 
I know, I know Nathaniel by the one who discredited Jesus. You remember early on in when, when, when they were bringing, when Jesus was bringing the disciples together and Nathaniel heard about this Jesus and he heard that he came from a place called Nazareth. He didn't come from Jerusalem, didn't come from the big city. He came from a country town like Nazareth. And when they were asking Nathaniel to come see this man and be a part of this group, Nathaniel said this, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nazareth was somewhat a country town, somewhat the hood. Anybody know anything about coming from the hood? It was a place where I, I believe the whole economy was based on one industry. You know, those towns that only survive because the factory is there. The factory moves out. The town goes down. Listen, listen, Lazarus was the place where they had, if you will, a, where, where stone masons live. We often call Jesus a carpenter. And when we say carpenter, in our understanding, we think of wood. But honestly, let me educate you. He was more of a tecton, a stonemason. He was there and he worked at a quarry there. So a carpenter in that day didn't necessarily work with wood. If you go back in that time in that region, you'll see that most of the structures are built by stone. And so Jesus worked with stone and it was a poor community, if you will. So when they talked about Jesus coming, Nathaniel said, listen, there must not be much to him because nothing great comes out of Nazareth at all. So when I think of that disciple, I think of that. When I think of Philip, Philip was a disciple that seemed to always be bringing folk to Jesus. That, that, that's kind of his character. Matter of fact, he brought his brother to Jesus. Then in another time when uh, Jesus had, had finished teaching and there were at least 5,000 men not adding up the women and children that were there and Jesus wanted to feed them, the disciples said, we don't have enough money, we don't have enough food. And there was a story, in the story, Philip, here's what he did. He brought a little boy that he found in the crowd who had a little lunch. And he brought this boy to Jesus. Jesus took these couple of fish and a few loaves of bread. And what did he do? He gave thanks for them. And he blessed and fed everybody that was there. When I think of the disciples, I think of Philip. I think of one who's always bringing someone to Jesus. And then there is, somebody say Peter. You remember Peter, don't you? I think of Peter. Here's what comes to mind. Cussing. Somebody say amen. I kind of think of myself when I think about Peter. Here's what comes to mind when I think about Peter, impatient. Here's what, I, here's what comes to mind when I think about Peter, radical. I, I think uh, Black Panther-ish, if you will. Peter was a fighting fella. Amen? You remember that time, don't you, when they came to arrest Jesus in the God and Peter pulls out his switchblade. And what does he do? He cuts off the ear. I know sometimes we think it was a long sword, but actually it was a shorter knife. And he actually not just cut off. The idea is that he got so close to the soldier, he sawed it off. That ear of that soldier, he, he's radical like that. But yet, something else comes to mind when you think of Peter. You think of Peter as the one yet close to God, but yet the one scared because he denied the Lord. At the time when Jesus was arrested and he was there and they were having somewhat of a mock or, or an, un, an illegal trial, Peter outside there by the fire when someone recognized him and says you were with him Peter denied him how many times three times when you think of these disciples you think of certain things about them of course when you think of Judas you think of one who sold the Lord out who who betrayed him with a kiss and so so when you think of these disciples you think of their character but when you think of Thomas what do you think of you think of the name that he gained doubting Thomas he was a doubter that's who Thomas was and more than a doubter, Thomas was just an unbelieving fella. He was also a pessimistic kind of guy. You know anybody like that? That if you say the sky is blue, they'll say it's gray. If you say it's up, they'll say it's down. Thomas was a pessimistic kind of guy. There was a time when Jesus was going to the big city and they were looking for Jesus. And it was, it was, it was, the rumor was out. They were after him. And Thomas said, okay, let's just go and die. That's just how he saw things. Let's just go and die. He was very pessimistic in his outlook when Jesus was giving a dissertation with his, with his disciples one day. And he says, you know, I go to prepare a place for you and I'll come again to receive you unto myself. Thomas was the one that says, Lord, where are you going? We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And in response to that, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Thomas gains that name of being a doubter. More than that, he's an unbeliever somewhat, y'all. He is pessimistic in his outlook. And I want to say this today, that, that, that Thomas is not by himself. 
Thomas is not by himself. Let me educate you here that his name, uh, Thomas, was an Aramaic name. But the Greek version of his name was Didymus. Everybody say Didymus. That was the Greek version of his name. And of course, the names meant the same thing, just said differently or understood differently in different cultures. So in Aramaic, it was Thomas, but in Greek, it was Didymus. That ought to say something to you. The Bible is often clear in explaining that Thomas Didymus was a twin. And that's actually what his name meant. Thomas meant twin, or the name Didymus in Greek meant tw twin. Some of us know that because we've used the word similar to that in our vernacular. Sometimes when somebody would say something and you agree with it, you want to say the same thing without saying the exact words, you would say ditto. And so the word ditto etym etymologically is related to the word didymus, which is the word in Aramaic Thomas. He was a twin, but yet we never got a chance to meet his twin in scripture. He was called a twin, but obviously his twin, whether it was a boy or girl, didn't walk with Jesus the way he'd walk with Jesus. We never heard of his home and upbringing, and we never got to, to understand if his, if his name was Thomas, was the twin's name Ramos? I don't know. Usually twins have names similar to each other. We don't know uh, who his twin was, but we know he had a twin. But let me, can I, can I, can I, can I kind of interject and, and tell you who I think Thomas's twin really is? Look at yourself. I believe that you and I are twins with Thomas. Some of us, some of us, I know some of y'all looking at me funny, like, like, but let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Have you ever gone through a point of doubt? I, I don't know if you can really be a believer if you haven't gone through, through some moments of doubt. So some moments of I don't know, some moments of I don't, I can't figure this out, some moments of it doesn't make sense to me. I, I believe that all of us have gone through moments of doubt and maybe even moments of unbelief. You know, there was a man that came to Jesus and Jesus said, do you believe? And the man said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Have you ever been there where you believed, but something hit you so hard, it caused some unbelief in you? You trusted God, but you still didn't know how it was going to work out. I believe that Thomas is our twin, not all the time, but I believe there are times we walk just like Thomas, we doubt just like Thomas, we have unbelief just like Thomas, we are pessimistic just like Thomas. Sometimes we hear God telling us to go, but we don't know where to go or when to go or how it's going to work out. And those disciples were just like that. All of us, I believe, are twins of Thomas. And let me say this, Thomas's twins aren't all outside of the church. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Certainly, we, we, we live now in a culture and society that is more unbelieving than ever before, than ever before. You ought, to, you ought to read some of the research that is done by certain groups. Barner is one that is very famous for doing research for churches and, and the church a culture, if you will. And some of the research they have come up with this new generation, this millennial generation, is a very suspecting and doubtful generation in a very unbelieving generation. Now, I don't need Barna to tell me that. I, I can answer that on my own. Let me, can I, do you remember growing up? And I remember growing up somewhat in a regular average neighborhood and everybody in the neighborhood, even if they didn't go to church every Sunday, they went to church sometimes. Y'all remember that? I mean, nobody, no, we didn't know what an atheist was back in the 70s and 80s. I mean, I didn't know what that was. There was nobody that would bold face stand and say, I don't believe in God. I don't trust in God. I don't believe he's real. Even the folk that only showed up at Christmas and Mother's Day and Easter would tell you they had a belief in God. But you know what now? Ask your neighbors. Go down the street. You'll find folk in your neighborhood, in your backyard that don't believe in God, don't care nothing about God. I tell you, there are Thomases outside the church, but sadly, there are Thomases inside the church. <sighs> Hurt my heart not long ago. Not long ago, can I tell you, there's some Thomases in the pulpit. Let me just cut to the chase. There's some Thomases in the pulpit. There's some folk preaching but don't really believe it. There's some folk that are preaching but they're going around the text. They, they can't believe that Jesus is the only way to God, that Jesus is the only way to heaven. There was a cross conversation going on the other day on Facebook and, and there was a question asked and a pastor minister answered the question and danced all around the question. The question to me was simply this, is Jesus the way? Y'all, how many of you know that when you tell the truth, you ain't got to dance around, you ain't got to give a paragraph, a dissertation, come on now. We, 
a simple question like that is Jesus the way I ain't even got to answer it the book has already answered it Jesus said I am the way I am the truth and I am the life no man comes unto the father but by me sadly even in our churches now we've gotten to a place where there's a lot of disbelief a lot of doubt amen a lot of unbelief in who God is we can't believe that possibly there'll be some folk that would die and go to hell some some don't even believe there is a hell can I tell you something y'all there's a heaven and there is a hell come on now and when you leave this place you either go into one or the other smoking or non-smoking anybody hearing what I'm saying today I don't know about you I'm going to the non-smoking place because I trust in the Lord but 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 but, but here my point my point is that Thomas was a person that doubted I want to I want to bring some comfort to you because all of us again have been there we've been at places of doubt and but aren't you glad you don't stay there aren't you glad you don't stay there and, and, and can I tell you why you don't stay there it's not because of you because you can get lost in your doubt you can get lost in your unbelief you can get lost in your pessimistic state but Jesus but, but I want to show you how Jesus deals with us in our doubt, deals with us in our unbelief. Same way he dealt with Thomas, I believe he deals with us in the same way. Here's a simple story. You remember Jesus died and then he was raised from the dead. And before the scene in which we just read, when Jesus was raised from the dead, the tomb was empty. There was a woman by the name of Mary who had gone to the tomb early that morning. And discovered that the tomb was open now, discovered that it was open and, and it was empty. She saw these two men that were angels. She was weeping and they simply said, why are you crying? And she thought that someone had taken the body of Jesus and taken it away. And she said, I was just looking for the body of Jesus. And, 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 and she didn't really expect the resurrection or the resurrected Jesus. She expected to go and finish what they started before anointing his body, if you will. But he was not there. And, 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 and the disciples said, don't, don't weep. And they told her uh, what had happened. And then she runs into another man who happened to be Jesus. And so she, 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 she ran into Jesus and Jesus showed himself to her and then told her, go and tell the disciples. Where were they? Well, they were scared because they felt like, you know, if they killed Jesus, we're next. And they were hiding out in a room and and the Bible says the door was closed, not only closed, the door was locked where they were. But Jesus gave Mary the assignment to go and tell them that he was alive and that he was soon going to ascend unto the Father. And Mary went there and of course she had to bam on the door, knock on the door. They were nervous, they were afraid because they knew that their lives were at stake. So they let her in and she told them that Jesus was now alive but as she told him there all the disciples weren't there of course Judas wasn't there by this time Jesus had hung himself based on what he had done his guilt if you will he had hung himself but there was another disciple that was not there and it was Thomas the twin and and where was he no one knows where he was some speculate that he was so upset and distraught and some speculate he was so stressed out and worried that that, that he ran away to, to, to be by himself. He didn't want to be with his friends and with the group. And that's sometimes how we are sometimes when we are stressed out. Isn't it something that when we're stressed out and worried, instead of us getting closer to the folk that are close to us, we separate ourselves. We, 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 we play the long ranger, if you will. And maybe that's where he was. There are some that speculate he was here or there. But let me also say that anyone who would say where Thomas was is simply speculating because the Bible never tells us. The only thing we know is the fact that he was not there. He was not there. He was not present when, when, when Mary told them. And then that same day when Jesus himself showed up, obviously after Mary told them and maybe left, they closed the door again and they locked the door again. And then Jesus later on the same day shows up. But guess what? How many of you know that Jesus doesn't need you to open the door or unlock the door? He just showed up. He, he walks through the door, if you will. And some say, well, no, that couldn't have happened. How could he do that? Well, if he can walk on water, he can walk through a door. If he can die and get up with all power in his hand, what's walking through a door? Star Trek ain't got nothing on Jesus. He shows up and he speaks peace to them. 
He says, peace unto them. And he shows them his hands. He shows them his side. He blesses them. And then he commissions them. He reminds them that they have a role to play. They have a job to play. But as he is doing this, remember now, Thomas is not there. Then Jesus leaves. He leaves. Now watch this, y'all. How many even know Jesus got up on the eighth day? If he died on Friday, then the Sabbath is Saturday. He got up on the eighth day, which is the first day, right? The eighth day is the first day of the week. And so that's when he got up. He got up on Sunday. So he showed up to his disciples on Sunday. But we pick it up again where it says eight days later, he comes back. Thomas missed it, didn't he? You know why Thomas missed it? Because he didn't go to church. Somebody say, hey, man. He didn't go to church. Do you know what you miss when you don't go to church? Let me just put a pen and say this to you, y'all. There is nothing like coming to the house with other believers in praise and worship. There is nothing that can replace our fellowship and coming together. I thank God for CDs and DVDs and live streaming. Let me talk to your live streaming folk. If you're live streaming because you just chose the live stream, uh-uh, that ain't right. Live stream if you can't make it here. Live stream if you're sick and shut in. Live stream if, you, if you're at work and can't make it. But if you can make it to the house, nothing replaces coming to the house. And Thomas missed out on Jesus because he didn't come to the house. He missed worship. He missed the gathering. So what I love about Jesus, I'm going to give you these three things, because in his disbelief, in his unbelief, in his doubting, when Thomas came back to be with the group, they were trying to tell him. They were witnessing to him. They were saying, we saw Jesus. Jesus is alive. He's no longer dead. The tomb is empty. He showed himself. We saw the nail prints. It was him in his hands. And, and, and we saw the piercing in his side. It was Jesus. And Thomas says, I will not believe. He said, I will not believe. Now, in one sense, we can get mad at Thomas. But in another sense, I kind of admire Thomas. I I'm kind of like Thomas in that sense. Sometimes I need more than your witness. Sometimes I need more than your testimony. Sometimes I, I need more than just to ride in on your faith. Anybody hear what I'm saying today? I don't know about you. I'm glad I got my own faith. I thank God for the faith of my mama. I thank God for the faith of my father. But I'm glad I got my own faith. I'm glad I've come to, to know him for myself. And that's what Thomas was. Thomas said, I hear you. I hear you. In one sense, Thomas said, I'm an unbeliever. But then he did say, I am a believer. Here's what he says. He says, I hear you. But I will not believe until. So he didn't exit totally out. But the problem was Thomas believed more in his own scientific ex exploration than he did in Jesus coming back from the grave. Thomas said, I got a test for Jesus. Well, here's what I like about Jesus. Tell somebody, he'll give you another chance. Oh, yeah, he'll give you another chance. Anybody here know that he'll give you another chance? Anybody here know that Jesus is the God of a second chance? Oh, come on. Somebody ought to holler at me today. Anybody know? Anybody know that, that you're here because he gave you another chance? Come on, y'all. Help me praise him right now. Anybody know that, that, that God gave you another chance? Anybody know that he looked beyond your fault and your failure and he, and he gave you another chance? We often say that God gives us a second chance, but I don't know about you. I'm beyond my second chance. I messed up my third second chance. I messed up my seventh second chance. I messed up my tenth second chance. I don't even count anymore. Over and over again. He gives me another chance. And that's what he did with Thomas. I love that about God because Jesus could have said where well, he should have been there. Aren't you glad that Jesus is Jesus and your cousin ain't Jesus? Aren't you glad that Jesus is Jesus and your friend isn't Jesus? Sometimes, well, come on, talk to me, somebody. You know, had Jesus been somebody else, they would have said it. Well, it's their fault. They should have been at the right place at the right time. They should have showed up. I ain't coming back for that. 
It's on them. But aren't you glad that even though you were at the wrong place at the wrong time, Jesus didn't come on, talk to me, y'all. Pass over you, but he still gave you another chance. That's the God we serve. The Bible says that Jesus came back, gave Thomas another opportunity. Unless you dog out Thomas, I want you to know that today, this Sunday, is another chance for you too. Did you hear what I said? I don't see a day just as a day. I see a day as another opportunity. I see a day as another extension of God's grace. I see every day, every morning as another extension of God's love. Truth is, I have to admit, maybe some of you are too scared to say it. I haven't lived the best life I could live. There are times when I've blown my chances, I've blown my opportunities. But aren't you glad that God is a God of another chance? But then secondly, watch this, y'all. Not only did he give Thomas another chance, not only did he give us another chance. How about this? He will meet us where we are. He will meet us where we are. Thomas said, I will not believe until I see his handprints. Until I am able to put my fingers where the nails were. I guess Thomas said, even if he shows up, I want to make sure it's him. He said, I don't want some imposter to come and act like Jesus. I, I, I saw what happened to him on Golgotha's hill. I, I saw those nails in his hands and in his feet. I saw them pierce him in the side. And until I see those things, Thomas was saying, I will not believe. So not only does Jesus give us a second chance, but Jesus also meets us where we are. When he came back, Jesus didn't have to do those things to Thomas. He didn't have to show Thomas where uh, the nail prints were. But Jesus decided that he would acquiesce and come down to Thomas's level. Somebody here ought to praise God that God will come down to your level. Now here's what I mean by that. Notice it was only Thomas out there on this island. He was out there by himself. All of the other disciples had already embraced the fact that Jesus had come back. And Thomas was the only one out there by himself. Jesus could have, y'all, did a grading system and said, well, I had 12 disciples. One is dead and one's an unbeliever, but I got 10 left. And that's still a passing grade. But aren't you glad that God is not just worried about a passing grade? That God is worried about you 100%. God, Jesus could have said, well, well, that's just Thomas. No big deal. We'll find somebody else. C can I tell you that people will replace you quickly? Can I tell you that people will give up on you quickly? But is there anybody glad that Jesus has not given up on you yet? You might be the only one, the only holdout. But I'm glad that Jesus, yeah, y'all, 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 y'all has not given up on me. I told the church a while ago that if you were the only sinner left on earth, I believe Jesus still would have come down and went up on the cross. I believe that Jesus still would have died for you because you are that valuable to him. Anybody know that God values you? Anybody know that God loves you? And just like he loves you, he'll die for you. There are many stories in the Bible that explain God's love for every one of us. There was a woman that had 10 coins. She lost just one coin, but that one coin was so valuable to her that she turned on a light in the house, began to sweep the house, and she kept doing it until she found that one coin. There was a shepherd, y'all that had 100 sheep and one of those sheep went wandering and was lost but that shepherd cared about that one sheep just as much as he cared about the rest of 99 and he left the 99 in a safe place that he might go find that one lost sheep anybody know about the father that had two sons and the younger son acted a fool and he said father give unto me the portion that falls to me 
I don't, I don't want to wait until you're dead. I want what comes to me right now. And that young son left the house and went out into a far country and wasted his living with prostitutes and whores. But aren't you glad that the father never gave up on him? Every day, I believe the father was praying for him. Anybody ever have a lost child, son or daughter? Have you ever been that lost child? You ought to thank God that somebody didn't give up on you. Aren't you glad that somebody prayed, prayed for you, had you on their mind, took the time to pray for you. I'm glad that Jesus gave Thomas another chance. And if he gave Thomas another chance, there's still hope for me, y'all. But not only did he give him another chance, he met Thomas where he was. I don't know about you, but all of us are in different places when it comes to the Lord. You get yours the way you get yours. I get mine the way I get mine. But I'm glad that God doesn't have a one-size-fit-all kind of salvation. When he talked to Nicodemus on that night, he talked to Nicodemus about being born again. But when he talked to a woman at a well, he talked to her about living water. When he talked to a judge, the rich young ruler, he talked to him about selling everything and following him. Aren't you glad that God doesn't have a one-size-fit-all kind of salvation? Aren't you glad that God has a tailor-made program just for you? I know some of you were saved when you were a little child and you've been in church all your life. You've been in Sunday school every Sunday. You've been in the training every Sunday. Well, that's how you got here. I'm not making fun of you. Praise God for you. But some of us were a little more hard-headed. And aren't you glad that God didn't discount our hard heads and didn't discount our hard hearts? Aren't you glad that God... You see, I grew up in church, but even though I was in the building, Sometime I wasn't in the church. I remember slipping and sliding, crooking and hooking. But I'm glad that my God had a tailor-made salvation program just for me. Is there anybody in here that knows the Lord loves you enough to come down to your level and meet you where you are? But I got one more thing to say. Not only will Jesus give you another chance, not only will Jesus meet you where you are, but I'm glad that Jesus is a transparent God. Yes, he is. He came to Thomas and said, Thomas, look at my hands where they pierced me. Look at my side, where they pierced me, here I am. Jesus was not ashamed to show Thomas his scars. His scars because of sin. Not because of his sin, but because of you and I. It was our sin that had Jesus on the cross. But he said, here are my scars. I'm closing here now. But can I say something to you? Anybody in here know that we got to be like Jesus? Some of us have scars, but we are afraid to show people our scars. So what do we do? We put makeup on to cover our scars. We dress up to cover our scars because we don't want folk to know where we've been. We don't want people to know what we've done but i'm here to tell you if you've been born again 
if you've been raised from that old way of life you don't have to be ashamed of where you come from you don't have to be ashamed of your yesterday you don't have to be ashamed of your past anybody in here know that God if he's not ashamed of you why are you ashamed of you God saves you knowing your yesterday God saved you knowing your past God saved you knowing what you did yesterday aren't you glad that he saved you he looked beyond your fault and met you at the place of your need come on and shout with me come on and give God glory give God praise give God worship somebody ought to help me praise him I'm not worried about my yesterday I got some scars I've got some scars but I'm glad it's just a scar it doesn't hurt me no more it's just a scar it doesn't pain me no more it's just a scar there are some folk outside of the church that would be inside of the church if you and I stop acting like we got it all together stop acting like we've been holy all our lives stop acting like we've never sinned and come short of the glory but I'm glad I'm glad I'm glad he looked beyond my fault and met me at the place of my need hey come on and give God praise look back over my life hey, and I think things over I can truly say do I have any testimonies in here any folk got some scars some bruises anybody got some wounds but you ain't worried about it because you know what God has done for you you know where God has brought you. You know how God has kept you. Hey! Hey! Praise his name. Help me praise his name.